I'll just have to be mute. So today we are pleased to have Adam Bergasser as our speaker. Adam is a professor at UC San Diego, and he runs the Cool Star Lab there. Um, the lab's uh, research focuses on studying properties of the lowest mass stars and the coldest observational techniques. Um, and one of those properties that they study uh, is weather on brown dwarfs, which Adam is going to talk about today. So, Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, so thank you everyone for uh, coming to hear uh, uh, what's really going to be kind of a more of a review talk of sort of where we are in terms of weather on brown dwarfs. This is a subject that's been developing over the last, I would say, decade or decade and a half. Um, and just in the last uh, year or two, we've had a number of observations, but also theoretical breakthroughs that uh, have not only enriched this field a little bit, uh, but also have challenged some of its fundamental assumptions. And so I'm going to sort of uh, try to talk about that a little bit. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to talk, reason I want to talk about this is that this is an, a certain an area that is particularly relevant for LCOGT, LCOGT <coughs> because one of the ways that we understand that there are clouds and study the properties of the clouds on these objects uh, is through variability studies. So this is exactly the kind of science that LCOGT uh, is very strong at. Um, so. Uh, so I should say, if you know, if at any point you need to walk out, go to the restroom, get some air, stretch, feel free. I won't be offended if you need to kind of move around. Um, if you have any questions at any point and you want to interrupt me because I said some word that you've never heard before, please do so. So don't don't feel about this is I'm, I'm very informal in my my presentations. Um, and one thing I'll say is I, I want to I'll give you the endpoints first so that if you want to think deeply with your eyes closed for the next hour. You can do so at least to get the, the main points. Um, so the first one is that you know uh, this process of cloud formation evolution that of course here on planet Earth we're very uh, adjusted to. We know that clouds form here um, is actually a fundamental part of brown dwarf atmospheres. It's not just an aspect of brown dwarf atmospheres. But it's actually a driver of a lot of not just the temporal properties but also the long-term evolutionary properties of these objects. And we'll see that when we talk about the transition between two particular spectral class, classes of objects, the L dwarfs and the T dwarfs. Um, but it's not just a nice feature of brown dwarf atmospheres is actually something that seems to be very uh, physically important for understanding how we interpret uh, their physical properties. Uh, and probably also exoplanets as well, as I'll make that connection later on. Um, the variability that we observe today points to some fairly complex structure in brown dwarf atmospheres, both horizontal structure, so unevenness and cloud coverage across the surface, but also vertical structure. We're seeing evidence of vertical structure in these atmospheres uh, from these observations. And that this structure also varies in time. So that's really why this is a talk on brown dwarf weather, because this is the changing of the clouds as they, as they evolve over time. Uh, so both spatial and te temporal variations are seen in these objects. Uh, but the, Real kicker on this is that now we're starting to question whether all of the stuff that we're seeing, and we have described the clouds for the last 15 years, really is clouds. And so I'll talk about sort of these new ideas that have come about interpreting uh, the behaviors that we are seeing and whether there are other interpretations that need to take into account uh, when we look at this. Okay, so first I want to start with a little context. Uh, why do we actually care about weather on brown dwarfs? Um, I'll start with just why we care about brown dwarfs in general, and I have to go back a couple thousand years to thinking about how we look at the sky. Um, and going all the way back then, you know, we classified those sort of bright points in the sky. There were either things that stayed put, at least from night to night, they may have moved a little bit over the course of the year, uh, and things that moved uh, measurably noticeably over the course of weeks to months. Uh, and that really is our sort of classifications of stars and planets, at least from the, uh, from the sort of archaic uh, perspective of looking at the sky. And of course, we know physically these objects are very distinct from each other, right? Stars generate uh, energy from the conversion of mass into heat, um, and they are the sources of light in the universe. When we look back at the most distant redshift galaxies, we're looking at stars. Uh, ultimately. So we're really, those are really the generators of light. When we look at planets, we're mostly looking at, if we're actually seeing them, detecting any light from them, most of the time that we're, we're mostly looking at their reflected light. Of course, if we're looking at thermal emission from uh, secondary eclipses, that is a case where we're actually looking at the planetary heat. But for the most part, when we talk about planets in our own solar system, when we talk about planets in other solar systems, we're looking at objects that are, are basically mirrors. Right, they're reflecting the light that is shining in them from other stars. Uh, and of course, there's a big difference in size as well. Now this, now this picture of the 1960s because, you know, some of the great sort of revelations about what's out there in the universe comes from questions that three-year-olds can answer. And the question the three-year-old can answer is, how big does this thing really have to be? Could this thing be that size? Or could that thing be that size? All right? And uh, in the 1960s, uh, as we uh, um, 
as sort of the theory of, of hydrogen fusion and, and other fusion processes was developed and sort of models, the first models for stellar interiors were really looked at. One of these questions I get asked is how small can a star be? How small can you have an object uh, and still actually do the thing that stars do, which is fusing uh, hydrogen into fusion? And so this is a plot from uh, one of those first studies that looked at that, uh, that limit. This is a, a plot from Shiv Kumar's 1960s um, early investigations is also worked on by Hayashi Nakano independently in Japan. And again, essentially they just looked at it and said, what's the smallest thing I can make that could actually start fusion reactions? And so this plot is showing um, the evolutionary tracks. So looking at core density versus temperature, the sense of these tracks is in this direction as the these uh, sort of initial spherical balls of, of gas collapse down, they're getting more dense, and they're converting that gravitational potential energy into heat. And for most stars, that would happen until you get to this point where you've actually started, you've got the core temperature high enough uh, to ignite uh, fusion reactions, and now that becomes essentially the supporting structure for the star, right? The pressure, the thermal pressure from those fusion reactions keeps the star from collapsing any further. Um, but of course, smaller stars have to collapse a lot further to get the same amount of gravitational potential energy out. And so you have to shrink these small stars further and further. And at some point, you're pushing the uh, particles, and particularly electrons, close enough that the supporting structure is no longer the thermal fusion from thermal heat from fusion, uh, sorry, thermal pressure from fusion, but it's actually just the fundamental quantum degeneracy of the electrons themselves. You literally can no longer either compress the electrons close enough or cool them off because all the quantum states and the gas has been filled up. And so that sort of, those high energy electrons in the outer layers of that Fermi gas essentially provide this, uh, the structural support for these objects. And at that point, you no longer can collapse the star, you can't heat it up any further, and now you've failed, right? Failed as being a star, it never got hot enough, never got high enough pressure to start fusion reactions in its core, right? So this is the theory 1960s, a wonderful and great idea. Um, and it took about 30 more years for people to actually go out and start looking for these objects and finding them. Um, so here's the picture then with after this theory model, you've got stars and planets and you got something in between. Something that probably formed like a star in the sense that it formed from collapse and cloud gas, but for whatever reason, uh, in this case, the reason being electron degeneracy, doesn't, isn't able to actually start those fusion reactions. So it has the structure in the sort of planet, in the sense that it's not generating this light, um, but it has the origins of a star. So this is something that's other, something that's not quite stars or planets. Um, and now this has a fairly fundamental impact on the long-term evolution of these objects. So this is now more recent models uh, by Adam Burroughs um, looking at the effective temperature of different kinds of objects as a function of time. Uh, and so, uh, and this is here in Kelvin, this is on a log scale, and so you may have stars, and these are sort of the masses and solar masses, which are a little too small to read, but uh, this goes down to about 8% 8, 8 of a solar mass. Uh, these objects, of course, at some point do get hot enough in their cores and can uh, ignite fusion, and they can achieve this sort of thermal balance between the radiation coming off and the energy generated from their cores, so these stay about the same temperature for trillions of years, right? These are the most long-lived objects that you can imagine. Um, and, uh, and they just sort of stay at this sort of nice sustained hydrogen uh, fusion uh, uh, sort of equilibrium temperature. But these objects that can't fuse cool throughout their entire lifetime. So they're unstable, at least from a thermal perspective. At some level, we've actually gone back to 19th century astronomy with these objects. If you ever wondered why we call stars early or late type, all right, before we understood that fusion was an important process, stars started off hot and they ended up cool over time. That's what brown dwarfs do. Right. They change their temperature over time. They're fundamentally evolving objects. Now, depending on your funding source, you might even define another class of objects uh, that don't fuse anything. So this is a boundary set by hydrogen fusion. This is a boundary set by deuterium uh, fusion, which is the easiest element to fuse in these cores. If it's not fusing deuterium, it's not fusing anything. Some people will call that planets, particularly if NASA funding is involved. Right? The names aren't so important. What's important is that these are fundamentally different objects from stars because they change the time. Now, that, that is both an interesting aspect but also a problem when you're going to look for these objects because if they are cooling over time, they are getting fainter and fainter as they evolve. And so, as I mentioned, the theory was worked out in the 1960s. It wasn't until 1995 that really the first examples of round dwarfs were found. This is, um, I would say, the, the only beautiful astronomical image of a brown dwarf. Uh, this is actually hanging up the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, this is a, a, an 
artificially colored HST image of Gliese 229b. Uh, that's this object right here. Gliese 229a is actually a very low mass star, an early type M dwarf, uh, fairly close to the sun. Uh, and this object is many, many orders of magnitude fainter and is, is bound to that object. And so at the time when it was found, it was realized that this was something that was so faint that it's certainly much fainter than any of the stars that were known at the time. Uh, the real thing that nailed uh, this as one of being one of the first brown dwarfs was the fact that the spectrum was also completely different from any of the stars that had been known at the time. So this is a, um, a plot by Tom Jabal back at the, in the 1990s uh, showing the spectrum here of Gliese 229b in the H band. So this is about 1.6 microns. Uh, and this is the spectrum of the moon Titan. And of course, the one thing they share in common is they're, they're certainly not common in terms of physical properties. Titan is a small moon, very, very cold. Uh, Lisa 229b is actually about 1,000 degrees Kelvin. But they both have methane in their atmospheres. And methane is something that cannot be stable <laughs> in the atmospheres of hydrogen burning stars. They just don't get cold enough in their atmospheres to have these molecules. So in some sense, this is the smoking gun for finding a brown dwarf, this pre the presence of methane in its atmosphere. And it also reminds us that these things have fairly complicated and, in some sense, planetary-like atmospheres as well. So that was about almost exactly 20 years ago. Uh, since that time, we've literally found thousands of these objects, uh, not just looking at nearby stars, but also uh, on their own in the field uh, through near-infrared sky surveys such as TUMAS and Dennis and more recently RISE. Um, this is a snapshot of what their spectral properties look like. Uh, these are examples of the uh, three of the four major sub uh, subtypes of uh, brown dwarfs. Um, M dwarfs are up here. These are things that look fairly black body-ish in their overall spectral energy distribution, but have uh, several molecular absorption <coughs> features that are present that do take bites out of them, particularly out here in the optical. Of course, these objects have been known for hundreds of years, but the coldest brown dwarfs are also M dwarfs. Uh, so you can find M dwarf uh, brown dwarfs as well, but they're usually very young. Um, these next two classes were objects that were found only in the past uh, 10 to 15 years. This is an example of an L dwarf where you can see there's much more absorption being taken out by uh, molecules, as well as atomic features. This really broad band that's about 1,000 angstroms in equivalent width is from potassium, atomic potassium. Um, we usually don't see these kind of features except in white dwarf spectra. We look at hydrogen lines, highly broad hydrogen lines of white dwarf spectra. But so much has been taken out of the atmosphere at the optical wavelengths here that you essentially see this incredible column depth of potassium underneath you, and you get these incredibly broad lines, a very unique feature that's common to L dwarfs. Um, here is an example of a T dwarf, uh, and this is something that looks like Lisa 229b, and you can see it looks nothing like these objects because it's being eaten away uh, by, by more absorbent molecules like methane uh, and um, much more water. In fact, uh, ammonia is also starting to come in in the atmospheres of these uh, T dwarfs. And this spectra looks a lot more like this spectrum, which is actually that of Jupiter, which is completely different temperature, but again has some of the same common molecular species in its atmosphere. So there's clearly a transition here from something that looks like a stellar spectrum to something that looks like a planetary spectrum, and brown dwarfs sort of encapsulate that, that transition between these different spectral types. Um, here's more of a diagnostic sort of plot of the different spectral types and what they contain. Um, the important thing I want to point out is the temperature, so we're looking at things that are cooler than about 2,000 Kelvin for these new spectral classes. Uh, going down all the way uh, to below 600 Kelvin, as I'll point out, this goes down all the way below freezing temperatures uh, for the objects we found so far. This is both a temperature sequence, right? It's a spectral sequence based on the shape of the spectrum, but this, these spectra are shaped primarily by their temperature. But again, for brown dwarfs, this is also an evolutionary sequence. If I go back to this evolutionary plot, temperature versus time, right? This is really a snapshot of the different spectral types, and you can see we follow one line of a common mass, a uh, uh, 0.05 solar masses here, uh, a brown dwarf over time will actually uh, encapsulate all of these spectral types as it evolves, as it cools off over time. So when we study different classes of stars based on their different spectra, we're not only getting a snapshot of different types of uh, brown dwarfs that are out there in the universe, but we're also getting snapshots in time of how brown dwarfs evolve. About how clouds come in and out of the, of the atmospheres of these objects as well. Yeah. So if you cut it the other way and you ask at a given temperature, how the properties of brown dwarf, the atmosphere is varied with mass. Is there a way to learn about the mass from the atmospheres? Yeah, so it's possible. So you know, these these objects, once you get past about 100 million years, have essentially the same radius. That electron degeneracy essentially freezes objects at about that same size. So what's really changing in that case is their surface gravity. And we do see surface gravity uh, diagnostics in the spectra of some uh, brown dwarfs. And that's one way that we can identify, for example, nearby 
young brown dwarfs and young associations versus just random field objects. It's much more subtle, though, than the temperature effects. OK, uh, let's skip this. All right, so and the, the coldest now that we've seen, thanks to Ys, are objects that go down all the way to 250 Kelvin. So this is the famous brown dwarf that was found just a couple years ago, one of the nearest systems to our sun, found just a couple years ago. And the reason, of course, is that it's so cold and so, and so faint that it, it required really Ys to find this. And so this is an object that we have uh, a rough estimate of about 250 Kelvin. Uh, this is a rough estimate because, in fact, this thing is so cold, we've only had one spectrum taken of this source, and it's pretty ratty spectrum, I would say. Um, but this object is very nearby, and it, it argues that, in fact, there's many of these very cool objects uh, close to the sun, but they're just so faint they're actually outside even today's technology. Um, but this is a natural consequence, because these objects are cooling over time. So we would expect a, say, 10, 15 Jupiter mass object to be about this temperature at the age of the galaxy. So there's probably plenty of these things around. But we're just trying to find them now. So this is the closest brown dwarf to us? No, it's not. So the closest uh, pair is Lumen 16AB. Is that right? They're, they're, clo they're just a bit closer. So Lumen 16AB was also was found a year before this one and by Kevin Lumen. That's why I call it Lumen 16AB. Um, and that's two brown dwarfs that are also a little bit less than two parsecs away. Um, I, will, I will have a, another uh, plot of that a little bit later on. But it's, it's actually kind of amazing that we're finding all these very nearby objects just in the next last or a few years. And again, that's because they're so cold that they've just essentially evaded uh, our technology. OK, so kind of the take home point from the context here is that these objects are ubiquitous. They're low mass objects. They cool to exceptionally low temperatures, right? Below room temperature objects. Uh, and as a result, they have fairly complex spectra because they have increasingly what looks like planetary spectra, particularly when you get below about 1,000 Kelvin into the T-dwarf and Y-dwarf regimes. And so at some degree, it's important to think about how we can approach these objects from a planetary perspective uh, as well as a stellar perspective. Uh, and by the way, just to drive this home, this is a, a beautiful plot that um, my former advisor, David Kirkpatrick, made in a paper recently. This is the HR diagram for everything on the main sequence, the quote main sequence. Um, the main sequence really actually ends right here. And these are the objects that have been found in the last 20 years since they're down to the coldest brown doors. This is a trillion in scale. It's 12 orders of magnitude in flux scale. Right? That's an amazing, uh, amazingly deep HR diagram. And most of half of it was found just in the last sort of 10 to 15 years. So that's, that's a pretty big uh, change in our sort of understanding of, of our universe. All right, so if we have to start approaching particularly these objects down here from a planetary perspective, it's good to sort of think about what are the main components of planetary atmospheres. And one of those main components uh, are condensates, right, material that condenses out. By the way, this is a picture from my hometown of Buffalo, New York. I know all about condensates. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, less condensates in San Diego. Um, so, uh, you know, we have a lot of planetary uh, astronomy, a lot of planetary science research to understand, to some degree, what, what planetary atmospheres look like. Um, but we're actually in a very different temperature regime, so it's important, it's actually useful to kind of go through what are the sort of chemistry, what is the chemistry and physics that we're talking about when we look at these, uh, these brown dwarfs. Um, this is a uh, very complicated sort of chemical equilibrium uh, plot. This is showing temperature versus pressure, uh, and these are just different lines indicating the uh, equilibrium abundances for different species. So for example, this line right here is the equilibrium abundance between carbon monoxide and methane. As you go to lower temperatures or higher pressures, carbon monoxide is favored, or carbon is favored to be formed in methane as opposed to carbon monoxide. So this is a transition, for example, that we see in the spectra as we go from aldehydes to T dwarfs. The so carbon goes from carbon monoxide to methane. So there's a bunch of these gas transitions, but all these solid lines down here are transitions between gas and solid species. So for example, in this sort of yellow band here, which corresponds to the temperatures of L dwarfs, uh, you have these transitions uh, between gas species and aluminum calcium oxides, titanium calcium oxides, and even liquid and solid forms of iron, right? These are, you know, these are just basic, basic chemistry, right? What gets, what, how these different species uh, uh, change state as they go through different temperatures. Now, uh, these kind of materials are actually familiar to us here on Earth as solids. Uh, there are common minerals that we find as rocks on the ground, right? Um, and not only that, corundum is actually something that we see in all sorts of different gemstones. The different uh, corundum with different um, 
uh, different impurities form these beautiful uh, gemstones. So we're not just talking about just floating piles of dirt, which is how uh, Adam Burroughs likes to describe these things. Uh, these are actually like beautiful, well of stuff, right? That's hopefully that will inspire you. Um, I haven't gotten anyone to, to get into a mining expedition yet, though. Um, so these are the predictions that come just from chemical equilibrium calculations that <clears throat> you should start to see some of these species condense out. Do we know this is actually the case uh, from an observational perspective? Well, we do see that in the evolution of the spectra as we go down to lower temperatures. Um, this is a set of optical spectra of, uh, going from a late M dwarf to uh, mid and then late L dwarf. You can see this deep slope is actually from this potassium feature that I pointed out a little bit earlier. Um, but what you, it, it's a little harder to tell uh, and what's highlighted by these yellow bands, uh, these are the titanium and vanadium oxide bands that are really the definition for M dwarfs. When you look for any kind of M type stars, you're looking for these titanium vanadium oxide bands. They were recognized uh, over 100 years ago. Um, and these disappear as you go from M down to L, and they're completely absent in this late L dwarf uh, object. So at least from, a, uh, from, from looking back at the chemistry, those gas species containing titanium and vanadium are condensing out into solid species, so we're losing the gas features. So they are definitely disappearing. And it makes sense from the chemical calculations that they must be disappearing into solid species. Um, we even have other evidence from mid-infrared uh, indicating that we actually do have these solid species. This is uh, originally worked by Mike Cushing. We did some follow-up work on this. Uh, this sort of depression here, which is not particularly exciting um, uh, from appearance, but actually lies right in the region where we see the same kind of features uh, and silica grain. We usually see these in emission in cometary spectra. In this case, we're seeing it in absorption. Uh, and so this is, again, one of the smoking guns that we think that there are, in fact, condensed species in these atmospheres because you wouldn't see these solid features otherwise. Yeah. Do you have models of the temperature profiles of these brown dwarfs? Yeah. Do you think they, they, they basically rain out and then evaporate again and then have some sort of water cycle like that? Yeah, I'll get that. I'll get to that in a, in a moment. Yeah. Uh, but there, this plot back here, I didn't point this out because I didn't want to get too much in time here, but these lines right here, these long dashed lines, yeah, are the pressure temperature profiles for an M dwarf and for Gleisa 290. And they intersect with these uh, yeah. uh, condensation curves, yeah. So is there a transition here that corresponds to that sort of hitch that, that was in the um, HR diagram? Where oh, between the you noticed that. The the this one right here? Uh, yeah. yeah, we'll get back to that. Oh, okay. But thank you for noticing that. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so so we have chemical evidence that these condensates are here. Uh, we have spectral energy distribution evidence when we look at the colors and magnitudes of these objects. This is actually a fairly old plot uh, from Gilles Chabrier. Um, but when you look at the colors, if you have a completely dust-free model, no condensates whatsoever, what you would expect an object to do is, of course, it's going to get fainter, but it's also going to get bluer as those molecular gas features come to dominate the spectrum. That's a little uh, non-intuitive, right? Usually cold things get redder, um, but it's mostly because of the molecular gas absorption that you see this change to, to blue colors. And indeed, glucid-229b is a blue object, but most of the L dwarfs are out here on the red end. And the only way to reproduce those colors is to have some kind of model that assumes some presence of condensate opacity. Essentially, it's grain scattering uh, that's scattering out the light from the shorter wavelengths and then allowing it to pass at the longer wavelengths. So you're sort of tilting the specter over to these red wavelengths. Okay. So that was a good evidence that there must be uh, some kind of condensate in the atmosphere. And more importantly, it seemed that we needed another, essentially, parameter to explain the diversity of the spectra and the colors that we were seeing in some of these objects. Um, so this is something known as a shrimp plot. This is just showing the uh, colors uh, in J minus K here, uh, so near infrared colors for different subtypes, and literally just kind of taking all the L zeros you have, for example, and just sorting them out by color and seeing uh, how many you have as you go across this, this, uh, this plot. It's because shrimp plot, because if you look at the back of a shrimp, it kind of looks like this. Um, and there's, a, there's quite a bit of variety here. There's, there's lay outliers sort of on the red end. It turns out that many of these are actually young brown dwarfs that we can see, for example, from the surface gravity features. Um, those are objects that uh, probably are uh, you know, tens uh, to even less in terms of Jupiter masses. Uh, they have very low surface gravities, uh, and they have very large uh, 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 scale heights in their atmospheres. And as a result, they end up actually having much redder spectra than we do for regular field dwarfs. A lot of that's controlled by collision-induced H2 absorption, which I haven't talked about, but it's something that absorbs out a lot of the K-band flux from brown dwarfs, also present, by the way, in Neptune and Jupiter, 
Um, but that, that change in the surface gravity can manifest in very red colors as well. Uh, some of these outliers over here, actually, we found our metal poor brown dwarfs. They're actually halo brown dwarfs. They have uh, velocities through space that, in some cases, go in the opposite direction of all the other stars in the solar neighborhood. Um, and so these are clearly objects that are very old, uh, depleted in their, in their abundances, and that has pretty profound changes in their, at their atmospheres. Uh, so that explains the outliers. The middle here is something that's a little bit more interesting from the perspective of this talk, um, because it's the spread in values, which can be up to half a magnitude, uh, is generally much, much larger than the spread in the, uh, the uncertainties in the, in the measurements themselves. And it indicates there's some intrinsic sort of scatter in the colors of these objects. We can see this also in the spectroscopy. These are a collection of uh, all L3 spectra. I think there's about 20 spectra here. And if we normalize just at one point, you get this sort of factor of two spread in the colors uh, at the red end uh, of these spectra. Uh, and to the point where, of course, us classifiers immediately hook onto this and say, okay, well, now we have to have new classes called red dwarfs and blue L dwarfs, whatever, right? The important thing is that there's quite a bit of diversity in the properties of these objects, uh, and that requires another sort of parameter, another handle to explain that. Uh, and so condensation may be that free parameter. So over the course of the sort of early 2000s, uh, several models uh, came into existence to explain these different uh, uh, ways that you can have condensation, what the condensates actually look like in the atmosphere. If you think about it, you know, when we look at the clouds in our own atmosphere, there's a lot of ways that we can describe them. The shapes, the opacities. Uh, if you're actually thinking about rain, the rain drop sizes, one species. So uh, these models are parameterized for different things, uh, an efficiency of how how easy it is to get the material down out of the atmosphere, uh, things like the supersaturation uh, level, whether you have coagulation of grains or not, or what degree of coagulation is in there, uh, rain size and cloud shapes, thicknesses, what pressure scales, there's lots of ways you can quantify and parameterize atmospheres of, of planets and brown dwarfs. Uh, but all of these are just different ansatz to understand how do we get from red objects here, explain those colors, but also explain the blue objects, these T dwarfs as well, and the transition between them. So a lot of the modeling work has been trying to figure out what is that right parameter to explain uh, not just the evolution, but also the different properties. And um, you know, this gives rise to lots of different ways of fitting spectra. It's actually quite annoying because there's many different models you can use. They all equally to some degree don't fit very well, um, but, but you're never quite sure which of these different uh, prescriptions for condensation is actually the right one. And, and to some point, that a lot of uh, observers are now coming to more empirical ways of uh, characterizing the, the condensates in these atmospheres. Um, this is work by a, a recent graduate uh, at, um, at uh, C, uh, CUNY, um, I think she's at CUNY, um, who's looked at uh, different types of brown dwarfs to explain the sort of different ranges of colors, basically just adding a sort of extra haze uh, scattering layer onto those objects and finds that, in fact, you can reproduce all of the reds and blue L dwarfs by just taking a normal average L dwarf and just adding some kind of haze to it. So maybe that is the right answer. We just have some hazes that we don't quite, you know, we just have to sort of parameterize in some other way. Um, there's lots of ways to describe this. And this is sort of the morass that we are in terms of understanding what do the actual clouds look like, at least from this sort of one-dimensional static perspective. Now, of course, if we look at real clouds, or so we look at real condensates in our atmosphere, they form clouds, right? So I keep throwing around clouds and condensates. Up to this point, we've really only had evidence of condensate material, right? Stuff that has gone into a liquid or solid phase and forms some kind of grains that may be scattered throughout the atmosphere. When we look at condensates in our own atmosphere, of course, they are, they're not everywhere in the atmosphere unless it's a particularly foggy day, right? They are grouped into certain regions, different pressure heights. You have bottoms of clouds, you have tops of clouds. And that's going to produce some additional structure to these models that you have to consider. To consider. So this gets into the cycles that you had asked about earlier. So accompanying some of these condensate uh, models is also prescriptions of how you actually group these condensates into actual structures in the atmosphere. How do you know where the condensates reside? That matters because, of course, the pr pressure in the temperature atmosphere varies through the atmosphere. And so condensates that are very high temperatures may act very differently than condensates very low and how much of those kinds you have at different regions are all going to come into play. So 
Uh, there's been a number of sort of studies on how you do this uh, from first principles, from planetary atmosphere uh, principles. Uh, one of the early works by uh, uh, Andy Ackerman and Mark Marley uh, basically, as I mentioned, used this sort of sedimentation parameter, essentially efficiency of how you, you get material to atmosphere. And that sets things like the heights of the clouds. So what you see here, these sort of colored regions are meant to represent the regions where iron and silica clouds reside, at least in pressure space, right? And then uh, the density of that material uh, these other lines sort of give an idea of what the uh, effective grain size distribution, or at least the mean grain size of the particles are. Uh, and depending on different temperatures, the sedimentation efficiency, you get the clouds in different places in the atmosphere. All will change with those different parameters. Uh, Christian Helling's group at St. Andrews has done a lot of sort of, I'd say, sort of more first principles work looking at uh, how how to grow through nucleation and grow in our atmosphere, only one kind of water. Multiple species. the grain will actually just explode. It's called Coulomb explosion, and that sets a limit to the grain size distribution as well. So there's lots of microphysics that are going into understanding how you would get different uh, grain size distributions and also where the grains are actually residing in the atmosphere. Uh, here's a, a, a more cartoon version of, of the complexity of this. If we look at different spectral types, as I mentioned, there's different species, and so in L dwarfs you might have uh, these minerals, uh, calcium uh, mineral species with some magnesium and iron sitting on top of them of these clouds is basically set by the condensation temperature, but how much they extend through the atmosphere is part of all that calculation of how you actually form clouds in the first place. Eldorfs are actually pretty easy in this perspective. We get down to T dwarfs, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different layers of clouds, different materials. Uh, different, you know, and sometimes they interact and sometimes they don't. They may interact more if there's more convection. Lots of details here. There's a model of what a Y dwarf and in fact Jupiter also might look like. And again, you've got multiple interacting layers. So this is not a trivial problem. And it's not a trivial problem from a planetary science perspective. It's even worse for brown dwarfs, where you're really just looking at a point, light, point of light in the sky. To add to that, if we look at clouds in, in our solar system, uh, where we actually have enough resolution to see their structure and to see how they change with time, both of those things are important. Right? So, uh, you know, we, we've heard of like, you know, spots disappearing uh, in, in Jupiter, right? I don't think the great red spot has actually disappeared here, but we have uh, different th features that come in and out of play over time. Uh, this, the reason this has shown up because this red band here disappeared for a period of time back in 2010. Uh, I'm not quite sure we still understand why that is the case, but it probably has to do with something with how the vertical oscillation of clouds uh, go through different temperatures and pressures up and down in the atmosphere. Uh, you have transient events that happen in Saturn's atmosphere, like this jet that formed back in 2011. Uh, you have other even small scale events like lightning storms that can have uh, imprints, not just on the structure of the clouds, you can see it's actually disturbed the, the layer through here, but in itself it's a source of light. Right? So all these now microphysics inside the atmospheres also come into play when we start to talk about condensates and uh, cloud species. Now, how does all this actually manifest itself in brown dwarf spectra? Let's, I want to go back to this evolutionary plot here. And I've highlighted uh, the regions where we think L dwarfs and T dwarfs reside roughly in terms of temperature. And again, uh, you know, that could encompass a wide range of masses at different ages. But we're really just looking at what the surface temperature basically looks like. Um, the spectra of these objects are very distinct. So the L dwarfs, as I mentioned, are in this region where we have we think mineral species are actually actively condensing out, so the clouds are actually at the photosphere. And we can describe their spectra and their colors by having condensates in the atmosphere that are having a, a role in the opacity. Uh, whereas the T dwarfs down here uh, can be described by models that are essentially don't care about clouds. We can get, ri get rid of the clouds and we would easily reproduce a T dwarf spectra. And so not only is there possible variations in the cloud properties, but we also see that in two major spectral types, one has clouds and one doesn't, or one can be modeled with clouds and one doesn't need them. So something must happen to the clouds between these two different species. Um, and uh, 
this gives rise to the, the kind of hiccup that you mentioned that you saw earlier in the HR diagram. Uh, when we look at the absolute magnitudes of these objects as we go from the L dwarfs into the T dwarf regime, um, and I'm going to kind of step through time and how we sort of looked at this. So this is back in 2002 where we, we had plenty of parallaxes for earlier type sources but not much for T dwarfs. It was noted back then that, well, one object was a little bright. Kind of all we knew at that point, right? One object was a little bright. Um, over time, as this got filled in, you can see that, well, now there's a couple objects a little bright. Might, might, might be wrong. They might just be binaries. It's okay. Uh, now we know that there's actually a, a large change here, that there seems to be this phase as you go from the L dwarfs to the T dwarfs, uh, that not only are you losing clouds, but you're also having this weird inversion in the, in the cooling properties, at least the brightness properties of this one wavelength. They seem to actually get brighter as they get colder. And that suggests that there's something more dynamic that's happening to these atmospheres than just, you know, they're just slowly getting colder over time. <coughs> I would say the more dramatic example of this is when we look at binaries that are actually composed of L, late L dwarfs and T dwarfs, we see this really amazing thing where, uh, in fact, uh, you can see this inversion, this brightness, in the two components. And so um, this, is the, this is AO imaging of this particular system, 2MAS 1404. Um, and this is at J band, H band, and K band. And you can see that what you call A or B depends on what wavelength you looked at it in the first place. So I think in this paper, they actually look at the K band first and they labeled the bright thing K-band A, but if you looked at J-band first, you'd actually get it wrong. Right? This is literally flipping in its brightness. This is now a breakdown of that. So the, the black line here is the combined light spectrum of this binary. And what we've done is we've actually taken the photometry and a library of spectra and, and sort of inverted out what are the different components of the, the actual individual spectra of the components. That's the blue and red line here. And you can see that T-dwarf, which has strong methane absorption, is something like 30% brighter at this one micron region than the L dwarf, but not over here. So the spectral energy regions are changing, but it almost looks like we took some light that was over here, massed it out with molecular gas capacity, and then shoved it back over here. That's not really how spectral analysis works, of course, but uh, there must be a change in opacity that is allowing light to come out at these shorter wavelengths and uh, suppressing the light at these longer wavelengths. This is certainly molecular absorption from methane. What's happening here, at least the explanation that we can come up with, is that you must be getting rid of opacity source, and that opacity source must be the clouds. So this bump in the evolution of normal brown dwarfs, which we can see in coeval binaries, dramatic shift in the cloud properties of the objects at this transition in the clouds. Through some process that we don't know. But that's at least what the, the observations seem to suggest. So back in 2002, to explain some of these issues, but also this kind of transition from the red L dwarfs and immediately switching over to the blue T dwarfs, at what seemed to be roughly a com uh, basically a fixed temperature, uh, we suggested that that parameter of cloudiness is not one that's necessarily fixed for objects, but there could be a, a phase of its evolution at this transition where you can go from an object that's very cloudy to very cloud-free. And again, the physical mechanism isn't that quite clear, right? But there must be something about clouds that changes as we go from, from these two, two different spectral types. And it suggests now even more dynamism in sort of understanding the cloud properties of these objects. Now, the, in more detail, what we proposed in this model was that, in fact, the clouds are not just all kind of falling out at once, but they're actually kind of settling out in sort of pieces. They're essentially becoming patchy. Because you don't actually have to clear out that much cloud to get a very bright, hot spot on the brown dwarf that you're seeing from Derek Devon to dominate the light, right? So you don't actually have to clear everything out. You could just have little holes that show up. If you have little holes, that suggests that you could start to see the features for these by looking for variability patterns as the object rotates. So that kind of takes us now to the sort of variability aspect of this, and how do we actually study clouds from a more dynamic perspective? How do we study them in time? Now, to give a little more context, is again, it's good to root ourselves in what we know about planetary atmospheres and how they change with time. Um, there was this great study that was just published this year looking um, at Kepler K2 observations of Neptune. We often don't think of Kepler being a local planetary mission. Uh, it's usually an exoplanetary mission. Uh, but Neptune happened to pass through uh, one of the K2 fields uh, back in uh, late 2014, um, and they treated it like you're watching a planetary atmosphere over time. This is the full 49-day 
uh, seriously, this is 49 days of the light curve. I think there's actually 70 days of, of uh, total observations. Uh, they analyze these 49 days, and you can see that it's a fairly complicated spectrum. The variations here are still pretty small. This is only about 1% uh, up and down. Uh, for the exoplanet folks, I'm sure that seems tremendously huge. But 1% is actually still fairly small. Um, and the important thing is that you know, this is a fairly complex light curve. It's not just a simple sine curve that goes up and down as, it, as Neptune rotates around. Uh, you're getting lots of different structures here. So this is a zoom in now, uh, five day segments uh, covering uh, sort of different periods within this light curve. And you can see that uh, not only do you get variation in the uh, sort of the, the amplitudes over time, but you can actually see there's a little bit of phase variation between these two different, different epochs. Right? They're not quite phase exactly right. Um, and when you do, a, uh, so when, when uh, Amy Simon did a Fourier analysis of this, which, uh, what she's able to find is that there are, in fact, uh, multiple peaks of variability, so multiple sort of sine waves within this curve. And those sine waves actually correspond to latitudes on Neptune's surface. So one thing to keep in mind from a planetary perspective is that when we look at uh, giant planetary surfaces, we don't actually see the rotation of the planet. What we see is really winds being driven across the surface. And those winds will vary uh, at different latitudes. And of course, they will actually go in different directions, different latitudes as well. And so the wind structure of Neptune gives rise to multiple rotation periods or multiple variability periods that then manifest into fairly complicated light curves. So working the way back, a complicated light curve tells us something that, that the surface is actually much more uh, structured or more complex than just a simple rotating star. Um, uh, another uh, researcher, uh, Arizona Carolidi, uh, uh, Theodora Carolidi, uh, looked at uh, essentially Jupiter images. So, you know, HSC images of Jupiter at different bands and generate synthetic light curves uh, from those. And uh, looking at both R band and U bands, and so here's the R band light curve, so that corresponds to this sequence of observations. Here's the U band light curve. Again, you see variability. The important thing I, I bring this up for is that if you look, the, the, these two curves are not in sync with each other either. Right? There's an overall phase shift from the U-band spectra as it composed the R-band, right? The peak for R-band is here. That corresponds to almost a minimum in the U-band. They're almost 180 degrees out of phase. And so uh, if you look at the images, you can see that, in fact, Jupiter, of course, looks very different, these two bands. And one of the reasons it looks different is you're actually looking at different layers of the planet, right? At the U-band, you're looking at the high uh, haze scattering layers, so you're looking very, very high up in the atmosphere. At R-band, you're probing a little bit deeper into the clouds. And of course, that's why you see more cloud structure here than you do here. The point for this is that by doing these different wavelengths, you're actually looking at two different layers of Jupiter at the same time. And the fact that they're out of phase tells you that there is vertical structure in the flows around the planet as well. So these little clues come, uh, again, from looking at our own, uh, uh, our own planets in our solar system uh, and their temporal properties. So what do we know about the temporal properties of brown dwarfs? So I'm just going to summarize kind of the high points. There's been lots and lots of studies over the last 15 years. And I'll sort of just summarize sort of what are the big points that we've learned about them. So the first and really important point is that brown dwarfs are highly variable. In fact, as near as we can tell, basically all L and T dwarfs are variable. Um, this is a result from uh, Sam Metchev, who did this uh, legacy program about 900 hours on Spitzer, looking at about 44 L and T dwarfs. Um, this plot is showing spectral type versus color, and then the symbol size indicates uh, both the uh, whether the source is variable, so if you see a circle, that source is variable, the size of the variability, and then the variability was measured in two different wavelengths, and so the, there's a sort of red and blue circles to correspond to those different wavelengths. Uh, and so you can see there's variability across this entire spectrum, all right? Uh, when they measured this sort of fraction of variable versus non-variable objects, you can see the fractions here. However, this is just what was observed when they went back and looked at their uh, sort of basically completeness corrections. Uh, they can infer back that basically all the L dwarfs had to be variable to some degree. May not have been detected in this study because it's just too faint or um, be looking at a different geometry. And then a significant fraction, if not most, T dwarfs are also variable. So variability is something we see all over the place, at least for brown dwarfs low level degree, but it's something that's very common. Um, the second point is that when we look at the variability in detail, we look at particularly spectral types, we see that the variability is, is, even though it's common to all subtypes, it seems to be largest in terms of amplitude at this LT transition. So this is work by Jackie Radigan, her thesis project. Um, again, looking at now a ground-based sample, the largest ground-based sample of variability. Um, the symbols here are the objects that she observed, so things that are purple are not detections. Things in blue are the things you did detect, and you can see, again, the size is dependent on the 
all the big circles right at this LT transition. That feeds back into this idea that the LT transition is a special period, sort of the, the cloud evolution of the ground warps. You see them in the mobility at that particular point. Um, we see variability all the way down to the coldest objects. This is a recent paper by Mike Cushing that's shown variability for a 400 Kelvin Y dwarf. Again, with Spitzer, you can see this very nice periodic curve. Uh, the time scale here uh, is something like, uh, this is something like a, a seven or eight hour uh, rotation period. Um, now, when we look at the light curves in detail, and again, this is because we've been able to build up lots and lots of light curves over the last decade, we can see there's a huge range of different properties. So in looking at starting at the middle, we see some sources that are incredibly stable. This is actually two years of Kepler observations of one L dwarf, and it has never varied in its amplitude or its, its phase. It's essentially spot on. You can keep your time with it. Right? Um, and it's, a, it's not a particularly slow rotator. I think this is something like eight or nine hours uh, rotation period. Um, but it has just been consistent on and on and on. Right? That's actually a rarity. The more common cases are the ones sort of on the outsides here. So this is, um, this is actually Lumen 16AB, that closest pair of round warps. You can see uh, there are, in this case, actually night to night, humongous variations in terms of amplitudes. I'll show, another, I'll show your plot in a little bit. Um, and then over here, this is, again, from the, the Metchev uh, uh, Weather and Other Worlds survey. So again, sometimes you get nice, beautiful sine curves. Sometimes you get these kind of weird oblong things. Sometimes you just get trends. Uh, sometimes you get stochastic stuff, right? There seems to be a huge variability in how these different, uh, uh, whatever is driving this variability, how it manifests on the surface. When we look at not just the photometric variability, but also how variability changes the function of wavelength, this is uh, some work that's been uh, really uh, headed off by Daniel Pai at University of Arizona. Um, we also see some indications of vertical structure. And so again, uh, so this is now, this is from WIPC3 data. These are uh, sort of the extreme spectra that were observed over the course of one rotation period for the source. And this is the ratio of that. And you can see that um, there is a definite change in the uh, spectrum at these sort of flux peaks. Uh, but less so here in the water bands. And uh, the interpretation is, in fact, so if, if it was the case where there was just one layer of clouds passed before them, then the expectation is that, in fact, this whole thing would be going up and down, right? The construction here suggests that, in fact, there's sort of an underlying cloud layer that's sort of even, and then there's another cloud layer that's patchy. Full heuristic model. But it points the idea that you can't just think of these as just one layer of clouds that may or may not be patchy, right? We're looking at sort of interacting cloud layers with potentially some structure. Um, this has uh, been filled in a little bit more. Uh, his uh, postdoc, Yao Yang, has been looking at not both T dwarfs and L dwarfs, and they show different behavior. And that sort of fits with this sort of cartoon model of the different cloud layers. In some objects, you're looking at very deep clouds, and so uh, you're only seeing sort of the variation of this cloud layer. In this case, you might be getting high haze, but also silicates in that case. This doesn't change very much. This basically sets a floor, and so you don't get sort of this uh, structured variation. You're just getting overall up and down motion, right? So that's again pointing at, at giving us the idea of vertical structure. And I think the most interesting result has been some work done by Esther Wensley, who's been looking at again variability at, at different wavelengths, but now across much wider wavelengths, where you can again sample different parts of the atmosphere. So think back to that picture of Jupiter at U band and R band. Uh, in this case, you can sample. Um, Pressures going all the way from about uh, 0.2 um, bars all the way down to 10 bars. This is at sort of the uh, very low opacity regions in the spectrum. And you see very clear shifts in the phase. So here at the sort of bright regions, they're about the same phase. But when you go over to the water bands, where you're at very uh, low pressure part of the atmosphere, you get almost 180 degree shift in the phase. So like Jupiter, we're seeing that there is vertical structure in this variability because we're actually probing different layers in the atmosphere. And again, that points to a much more complex spectrum than you would get, for example, uh, with just a star spot that's going around over time. OK. So just to summarize, these are the patterns that we're seeing. right? Uh, and these are sort of the interpretations that have come out of those. So the commonality of uh, variability suggests that patchy clouds is sort of the norm. It's not something that just magically happens at the LT transition, but it's something that's actually very common. Uh, for all brown dwarfs and suggests there's a lot more dynamics in the atmospheres than previously predicted. Um, the fact that it's more pronounced in the LT transition suggests that cloud disruption really is a process that's defining that, that transition. Um, the variability extends down to very cold temperatures. These Y dwarfs we think are starting to form water clouds. 
Water is a major gas absorber uh, in M dwarfs, L dwarfs, T dwarfs, and Y dwarfs, all the way down the end of the main sequence. And if it starts to condense out, even a little bit of condensation can drive tremendous changes in the atmosphere. So we're starting to see the hints of that very dramatic change uh, in, in, from evidence of patchy clouds. Um, the diversity of, of these light curves, if we think back to Neptune's very diverse light curve, it suggests that it's not just one feature coming in and out of view, but in fact it could either be uh, multiple features at different latitudes that are moving in different directions, maybe because of jet models, or it could be the actual evolution of the clouds themselves. We can't actually disentangle that at this point. But this suggests that there's a lot more dynamism, at least in terms of the horizontal and, and protection, temporal uh, evolution of these sources. Um, the wavelength dependence both indicates that there's multiple layers, and those multiple layers have some relative structure to them as well. Right? So we're building up a fairly complex picture of what a brown dwarf atmosphere is, even though, again, we're just looking at one point of light. Right? But we're looking at it over time. Let's get that. So, uh, I made the point that this is something that may be relevant for exoplanets, and I want to make sure I just make that connection. Um, this is just a cartoon plot showing the uh, different temperatures, again, for brown dwarfs and sort of where those different spectral types uh, reside. And again, you see that there are uh, L dwarfs, which we think are the really cloudy ones, the T dwarfs that are not so cloudy, although both of these are variable. Uh, and then just some of the example planets that uh, sort of correspond to the same temperature. Of course, they don't reside at the same distance from each other because some of, some of them are around hotter stars and some are around cooler stars. But you can see we have examples of uh, both this sort of L dwarf type and the T dwarf type. This is a little bit old, so we're missing some of the more recent discoveries. Um, but we have planets that really have the same temperatures as these brown dwarfs, and so we can ask whether they have uh, similar kind of condensation properties. Um, so the directly imaged planets uh, now have direct spectroscopy, uh, and we're starting to see that the, that data really requires, like, just like brown dwarfs, required some degree of condensation to explain their uh, energy distributions. Um, this is uh, from a paper by uh, Thane Curie looking at uh, the sort of uh, just photometric measurements of HR879b um, and comparing it to a model with no condensates. That's the dash line here, which fits fairly poorly. But as soon as you put condensates in that model, you can match up most of these data points. Now, that doesn't mean that this has condensates. It just means that the condensate model is a better fit. But at least some evidence that that's going to be the case. And this source, by the way, has a, has a surface temperature that's like an L dwarf. So that's sort of consistent with the sort of properties of, of brown dwarfs as well. Um, this is uh, now, so much of this work has been done more in transmission spectroscopy. And so I'm going to show you a few spots of those. Uh, just to guide your eye, if you haven't stared at transmission spectra for most of your life, um, this is a measure of the size of the planet, but it's really measuring essentially uh, the opacity of the outer atmosphere. If you have a more opaque outer atmosphere, the planet looks just a little bigger uh, as it passes in front of the star. And so uh, going up, this means more opacity. Going down, it means less opacity. Uh, and uh, these black lines are the measurements. Uh, this is from a large HST program looking at several planets, uh, as well as Spitzer. And um, what they point out is that the measurements, and you have, you know, I would say, this is my word of caution for planetary transmission spectra, there's lots of ways of fitting these data, so you have to kind of take that into consideration. But the way that they fit this data, they look at models that are uh, no clouds, which are these very strong gas absorption opacity variations, versus one which has a nice thick cloud layer, and that seems to fit a little bit better, at least in the optical regime. By the way, this blue slope is very common. We think this is actually from kind of Rayleigh scattering from hazes, which is, again, these are planets that are right up against their stars, so that's not too surprising. But it's really sort of this region where you have this kind of flat spectrum that people point to as, uh, as, as evidence that there may be clouds in the atmosphere of this planet. Um, it's useful to see the opposite case. So this is an example of a planet that people think don't have clouds. Um, this is a paper that just came out this year. You can see that instead of having that sort of flat region, there's actually some structure <coughs> Notice tracing those sodium and potassium lines, same kind of features that are in brown dwarfs. Um, and since it's tracing structure, they argue that there's really no sort of flat opacity uh, from clouds in this region. There are many ways of fitting these data, but that's one, one interpretation. Um, we've started to even push this down into uh, Earth-sized planets. Um, hopefully, some of you had heard about TRAPPIST-1 before we got completely scooped by Proxima b. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad we published before Proxima B. Uh, but uh, 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 Julian DeWitt, uh, who was working on the, the transmission spectra of the, of the inner two most planets, um, made this measurement where, again, you have basically a flat spectrum. Uh, he's compared it here to several different models that have, uh, that are, we call hydrogen rich, that's basically like a normal brown dwarf, uh, water rich 
planets are sort of more uh, exotic. But in this case, those are really don't fit very well. What you have is a flat spectrum, and a cloud model will fit that perfectly. Again, doesn't mean that it's a cloud model. Another interpretation, it has no atmosphere. Also, it's anti-correlated with, with the models you plot. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, this point is a little bit, yeah, I guess those are all going in the wrong direction. Um, is that a uh, subtraction problem? Anyway, it's interesting that it's yeah. it might not be statistical. It may not be statistically significant. So basically, we have no regular cloud-free model that fits this. So either there's a cloud model or no atmosphere at all. Um, and we're going to need to, we need, really need WSD to do this correctly. Um, but it's, it's one of many, many spectra now that have shown essentially no features and have been attributed to clouds. And part of the attribution is because when we look at brown dwarfs, they are much flatter because of their clouds as well. So that's sort of the synergy between those two. All right, now in the last few minutes, I want to completely blow all that away. All right, because that's, that's one interpretation for all these observations. And it hangs together. It's a beautiful story, right? All these different patterns seem to work very well when we talk about clouds. But there are other ways of doing this. And my, I, this is really interesting because this is one of my favorite artists is um, this guy, Sandow Burke. So that's the Wrath of Medusa, and that's the outside set at Malibu. So, you know, different situations. Great interpretation. Okay, I'll go on. Um, so... Other possibilities that can explain this are, are more traditional star-like things like magnetic spots. Now, uh, this was generally ruled out uh, early on because when we look at the traditional signatures of magnetic activity, things like H-alpha emission and X-ray emission, uh, those decline very rapidly. So this is showing the relative H-alpha to bolometric luminosity for a range of spectral types. This is from a nice study by Ado Berger. Uh, and you can see that in many studies, they've shown that this just drops off when you get to the sort of late M, early L, uh, early L dwarf regime. Uh, and the interpretation of this is that the atmospheres become so neutral because they're so cold that the magnetic fields are no longer coupled to the atmospheres. And so they don't recombine. You don't get these sort of ma magic, you know, large flares. You don't get these star spots that sort of form. And so that was always the interpretation that we can't, this variability can't be star spots because we don't have magnetic fields. Or at least we don't have strong magnetic fields. Well, when we look at radio emission, it's actually the exact opposite case. So I didn't have, I, this is not the best plot for this, but I want to sort of highlight some recent work by Melody Cow at, at, at Caltech, who's been looking at radio emission from, from T dwarfs. And in fact, all of these objects, so these are late L's and T dwarfs, all of these objects show radio emission. And their radio emission is actually quite high. So um, I'm not quite sure how to explain this, <laughs> this plot, but this is essentially a measure of the, um, the magnetic field strength, uh, sorry, this is a measure of the magnetic field, uh, field, field density. This is the magnetic field strength at the sort of photosphere where these measurements are made. Um, and then uh, this is sort of a, a measure of the available energy for magnetic field generation. Um, and the fact that we have detections for these objects with, uh, with magnetic fields that are, are pretty high, over 1,000 Gauss, right? These are kilogauss fields around these objects. Are these all isolated? Yeah. Well, so this, is, this one is a binary system. Um, these are all isolated. And this one is actually one of the variables, the very strong variables at the LT transition. Um, and so all of these objects are showing a radio emission. Um, we've seen radio emission down to 1,000 Kelvin objects. So the magnetic fields are not going away. So we can't actually rule out that as a possibility, that at some low level there may be some additional magnetic he heating. Maybe it's coming from the uh, chromosphere and heating down at the surface. Maybe it's generated from under the surface and emerging as flux tubes. There's lots of different ways to interpret this. But the idea, but the idea that there's no magnetic activity cannot be taken off the table. So that may be another source of this, this variability. Um, another possibility that was explored by uh, Mark Marley and Tyler Robinson uh, was that you actually have some perturbations at the lower uh, base of the atmosphere. Uh, one detail of the physical properties of brown dwarfs I did mention is that they're fully convective objects, right? The opacities and densities are so high that the only way you get heat out from the inside is to really roil it. Um, and so the idea is that if you have some kind of temperature perturbations at the base of the atmosphere, those will propagate through the atmosphere. Um, and so uh, a perturbation here of about 10 Kelvin, uh, because of just the thermal time scale of getting that heat up, will result in these kind of oscillations that are out of phase with each other. So um, this is now the spectrum from one to five microns, and this is just showing the essentially residual variation in the brightness. And that variation will be opposite at J-band as opposed to these sort of longer wavelengths. Now this is a, you know, this is really kind of a, uh, Gedanken experiment, right? We don't know that there are these oscillations happening at this particular frequency uh, and propagating up in any way. But it does provide an alternate explanation, not just for the variability, but also for the phase variation. It doesn't require clouds. It just requires some instabilities in the, in, in the inner, inner part of the atmosphere. <laughs>
Um, but I think the more interesting uh, suggestion has come out uh, just in the last year or two is some work by uh, the extra group um, looking at just regular fluid dynamics, and particularly fluid dynamics that's particularly relevant for, for the Earth, looking at thermal halines instabilities. Um, these are the things that form salt uh, fingers at the uh, surfaces of very calm oceans. Uh, they're responsible for the thermal haline circulation that keeps England warm, so, you know, it's a little important. Um, and we also think this is something that's important in sort of the interiors of the Earth and also the atmospheres of red giants. What essentially happens is that you have uh, a dense, um, dense gas, and so it's actually not so much that it's dense, but at the average mass per molecule is much higher. Uh, at the upper end of the atmosphere here, where it's methane rich, you have a uh, warmer gas, but has a lower uh, mean molecular weight. Um, and that comes from just looking at the reactions here. In this region, you have carbon monoxide. It requires three hydrogen to make methane. So you've got more molecules down here than, than up here. So you have essentially this denser gas sitting on top of a low density gas. And at the particular um, you know, densities and, and unitless uh, numbers you have here, the, the dominant form of convection is actually the sort of fingering instability that, we, again, we see in salt, salt fingers as well. And it turns out that this is happening not just at the L transition, but is actually describing the entire L dwarf class. By allowing this fingering instability to happen and then getting to the point where it just shuts off, that actually can explain all of the LT transition in its entirety. So this is, a, this is sort of their, their justification for this. Um, this is showing three different models, same temperature, same surface gravity, same uh, diffusion, but then sort of changing the effective adiabatic index, how much circulation that you can have due to this uh, fingering instability. Um, and you can see you get a huge change in the spectrum for essentially the same properties. Uh, and in particular, you get a spectrum that brightens <coughs> at these shorter wavelengths, much in the way that we interpreted the removal clouds would brighten up the spectrum at these shorter wavelengths. Um, and so just to prove that, they, they've been able to reproduce the entire sort of color magnitude diagrams for brown dwarfs, including this shift over to blue wavelengths, uh, sorry, bluer colors at the LT transition, but also a second shift that's now been emerging at the TY transition where you get nitrogen converting over to ammonia, which sets up exactly the same thermal halogen instability as the carbon monoxide and methane instability. So it solves two problems at once. And the thing they sell it on is it doesn't require cost. And the variability can be explained just by the fact that you're having this sort of structured uh, uh, instability as opposed to just sort of a uniform, uh, fully mixed uh, gas. So this has now been a big challenge to this whole picture. We've got, again, the same patterns, but now multiple interpretations of what that actually looks like. So I'll leave this with a, a plea, right? And I'll bring up one of Rachel's plots, is that one of the things we need more, most of is we need a lot more sort of characteriz characterization of the temporal properties of these objects, because it's really the looking at the sort of the complexity the periodicity uh, and the sort of long scale evolution of these objects in time is the only way that we're really going to get any information about the real detailed properties of the atmospheres. Uh, and so Rachel had this great paper uh, looking at Lumen 16b uh, using LCOGT, found exactly the same kind of just craziness over time. Uh, what hasn't been done for either this or any of the observations of uh, Lumen 16ab is actually fitting it to a re realistic model that tests each of these different uh, processes. Do we need to have clouds? Can this be explained by thermal halion instability? Is there something else that needs to be uh, explained for these different observations? The spectral observations are not going to do it because they're static. And this is clearly not a static problem. This is a temporal problem. Over time, and folks are working on this, is, is more temporal observations of these objects, both at individual photometric bands, but also across the SED, uh, to look at how this, uh, these spectra change with time based on whatever's actually happening in their atmosphere. Okay, so I'll leave you with my take-home points, and I'll be happy to take any questions on that. Thank you.